produce a loss of the secretory function, dryness, squamous metaplasia of the conjunctiva, gelatinization, scarring, and fibrotic changes like pore shortening of the fornices, symblepharon, entropion, trachiasis, distachiasis, etc. Giving us sometimes some end results like the pictures we're seeing right now. Picture number one is an acid trauma with a severe symblepharon. Picture number two is a Lyme trauma with a total corneal stem cell deficiency and a total corneal conjunctivalization. Picture number three is a firewall trauma with a severe symblepharon and ankyloblepharon. And picture number four is a, an iatrogenic severe symblepharon. Regardless of the trigger, we know inflammation itself is a very important factor determining the severity of the end results of any of the previous conditions. After the insult is produced, an acute inflammatory cascade is initiated. And if the insult is severe enough or the inflammation is not properly treated, the inflammation can perpetuate in time, producing, producing a vicious cycle of chronic inflammation. So when we approach these cases, I like to think in a tripod of treatment composed of pre-surgical measures, intra-surgical measures, and post-surgical measures, all of them working together to treat inflammation. What we usually use as pre-surgical measures is doxycycline PO, topical steroids, topical cyclosporin, topical tacrolimus, non-preserved lubrication, and punctal occlusion if we need. We basically are going to continue with all of these medications after the surgery. And at this moment, if we need, we're going to use the combination of IFU subconjunctival injection with Tramcinolol. And during the surgery, we use epinephrine 1 in 1000, human amniotic membrane, tissue adhesive, and mitomycin C. I'm going to explain all of this, but first I want to highlight some of these medications. First drug is doxycycline. This is not a new medication, but it is a very useful one for this kind of cases. Because it inhibits the MMPs, it inhibits the interleukin synthesis, it will inhibit the B cell activation and the collagen synthesis. So as we can see, this medication will be acting on the inflammatory cascade, and it will be also acting um, on the prevention of, of the recurrence of symblepharon after the surgery. Second drug is tacrolimus. This is a macrolid immunosuppressant that works very similar to cyclosporine, but it is reported to be 50 to 100 per, uh, times more potent than this one. This drug will block B and T cells. It will inhibit histamine release from the mastocytes. It inhibits prostaglandin synthesis. It will act as a neuroprotector and it inhibits the loss of both the epithelial cells in the conjunctiva and the goblet cells. As we can see, it will also act on the inflammation, but it will also help in, in the regeneration of the ocular surface. The last drug is FIFU. This is an anti-metabolite that works in, at the RNA level. This drug inhibits fibroblast proliferation and prevents collagen contraction. We can compare this drug with uh, another commonly used uh, antimetabolite in ophthalmology, which is the mitomycin C. The difference between these two is that mitomycin C is active during the entire cycle of cellular division, while FIFU is only active during phase S of cellular division meaning that it only acts in metabolically active cells that are in active proliferation. And this is what makes FIFU safer than mitomycin C for these kind of cases. And we're combining this drug with a steroid medication that, as we all know, they work at the DNA level, they will work on the inflammatory cascade, and they will decrease the fibroblast proliferation and the density extracellular matrix. As we can see, with the combination of all of these medications, we are acting on the inflammation, we are preventing the collagen production and contraction, and we are stimulating the ocular surface regeneration. 
now we're going to talk about human amniotic membrane, which is really important for this kind of surgeries, mainly because it's very rich in biological factors. It is the innermost layer of the placenta. It is composed by three different layers, epithelium, basement membrane, and stroma. It comes in different presentations. The one I like to use for this kind of surgeries is the cryopreserved ham that comes in a epithelium side up in a nitrocellulose paper, which is that blue paper that we can see in the picture. And we can use it for three different purposes. We can use it as a graft when we want to fill a hole, for example, in a corneal ulcer. We can use it as a patch when we want to isolate everything from the aggression and when we want to make use of the anti-inflammatory effect or we can do a combination of both. The human amniotic membrane replaces the conjunctival and corneal stroma that the eye has lost, and it will provide the basement membrane for the new epithelial cells to grow over. And it will also stimulate these cells because it is very rich in growth factors. It um, has a very important anti-inflammatory effect and it produces a very low immune response, which is really helpful after the surgery, keeping the eye quiet. And another important function is the anti-angiogenic function that's helpful after the surgery, preventing neovascularization. Now, I'm going to share two different cases. One of these two cases, had a good outcome and the other one didn't have a good outcome and I will explain why. This is case number one. This is a 10 year old boy referred to us for recurrence in blepharon evaluation in his left eye. He has a past ocular history of an ophthalmia in the right eye and an inferior lip coloboma in the left eye. Plastic surgery attempted the reconstruction of this inferior lip coloboma in 2014 and this surgery got complicated with a symblepharm formation. After that, he was referred to another institution, to a corneal specialist to attempt the reconstruction. The surgery failed. And it was at the beginning of 2017 when he was referred to us for evaluation. And this is what we saw. He had this severe symblepharm affecting almost the entire cornea. It uh, respected a small, that small area of superior limbus that we can see in the picture, it didn't affect the superior lid nor the superior bulbar conjunctiva, and it respected a small area of a nasal and temporal bulbar conjunctiva. This is case number two. This is a 10 year old boy also referred to us for symblepharm evaluation in his right eye. He has a past ocular history of a firework trauma in his right eye one year before the consultation. His left eye was normal with a 20-20 visual, uh, best corrected visual acuity. This is what we saw at that moment. He had this severe sort of symblepharm affecting the entire cornea. It also involved the superior lid with those two thin pillars that we can see in the picture. But behind those two thin pillars, he actually had a deep and formed uh, fornix in the superior lid. As we began discussing before, our usual, usual plan is to start with medical treatment for at, for at least three months or as long as it is necessary. Then we will go ahead and do the surgery. And after that, we will continue with the post-surgical management for as long as it is necessary, meaning until the eye is quiet again and the symblepharm is not recurring anymore. For the surgery itself, we do a two-step approach. We will first do the fornix reconstruction, then we will wait until the eye is quiet again. And because many of these cases will have a very severe coronal stem cell deficiency, we might want to contemplate a coronal limb transplantation. And we do this as two separate surgeries because it's been reported in many different papers up to now that doing this as two separate surgeries has a better outcome. So what do we find in the literature about symblepharm and fornix reconstruction? We find there are different grading tables primarily for monitoring OCP progression. In 2008, Turcotte all published a grading system 
that's independent of the cause and it is based on the length and the width of the symblepharm and the inflammatory activity of the ocular surface. This grading system is actually an update from a previous publication from Bascom Palmer. He also proposed a surgical approach guided by this grading system, but still there is no consensus or gold standard for this for the surgical approach. And this might be for because of the many causes that Simplefron has and the many structures that it affects. Some tips I always have in mind before going to surgery is to wait enough time for the eye to be quiet. There is no need to rush for these kind of surgeries. And I want to stress on this point because this is really essential for us to have a better outcome after the surgery. In order to decrease inflammation, we will try to reduce the use of calorie, replacing it with epinephrine 1 in 1,000. For the same reason, we will try to reduce the use of sutures, replacing them by, with tissue adhesives. It doesn't matter what suture we use, um, all of them may be at different levels, but all of them will produce some degree of inflammation. And if the surgery fails, we will, we will wait for at least six months before doing a new attempt. These are surgeries that we do under general anesthesia. We prep and drape the patient as usual. And the first thing we do is to place a traction suture through the tarsal plate. I like to use a five silk suture to do this. After we have the suture in place, we will start with the symblepharm lysis we have to try to release all the adhesions from the inner face of the lid to the ocular surface. And we have to try to be really careful when doing this step because there might be some um, uh, thinning in the cornea or the sclera, so we are at risk of perforating the eye. So it, it is best to be really careful doing this uh, when doing this step. After we have released all the adhesions, we have to try to uh, remove uh, all the fibrosis from the ocular surface. This is the picture we are seeing right now are from case number two, the firewall trauma case. For this case, to help with the fibrosis resection, we created 360 degrees peritomy. For case number one, the monocular patient, we only created a, an inferior partial peritomy and because we wanted to preserve that area of superior limbus that wasn't affected. And if the symblepharm is not this severe, we might only do some relaxing incisions in the conjunctiva. But for these severe cases, the peritomy is really helpful uh, deepening the fornix and for, and for the fibrosis resection. We have to try to dissect and resect the most amount of fibrosis we can. We have to try to dissect the fibrosis from under the conjunctiva, and we have to try to preserve the most amount of healthy conjunctiva we can. Oh. These are both patients after we have removed... Habibti, la, 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 inshallah, inshallah. Um, it is at this moment oh, when we yeah, use yeah, yeah. We will use it in the deep fornix. We will try not to touch any area of the sclera, and um, I usually use a concentration of 0.04% for four minutes, and then we will wash it out really thoroughly. And after that, we have to start with the reconstruction. We have to take some grafts to cover all the area of the sclera and the inner face of the lid that has been de epithelialized. We have a few different options to do that. We do a conjunctival out of the harvesting the conjunctiva from the contralateral eye. And this is the option that we used for the firewall trauma case. We could also harvest conjunctiva from the same eye. This is the option that we use for the monocular patient to cover all the area of bare sclera. And to cover the inner face of the lid, we harvest the conjunctiva from the contralateral inferior lid. We could also use oral mucosa or one of the newer laboratory cells comet, for example, but the problem with these newer techniques is that they are not readily available everywhere because they are very expensive and there is a need for a very specialized lab to do them. When we harvest conjunctiva, the question that comes up is where do we harvest it from? 
And these two groups tried to answer this question. The first group studied the location of the conjunctival stem cells, and the second group studied the uh, proliferative capacity of the stem cells in each location. And they reported that the interior fornix and medial canthus conjunctiva had the highest proliferative capacity. These two areas are also richer in goblet cells. And they theorize about a niche area. They think that these two areas might be the niche for the conjunctival stem cells. And this is because these two areas are more densely vascularized. They have a higher number of melanocytes and a higher number of immunologic cells, which is very similar to the coronoscular limbus. It has been also theorized in the past that transplanting the cells within their niche might, might help them last longer in a more hostile environment like the recipient eye will be. So after we did all the graftings, we will cover the entire ocular surface with human amniotic membrane. We will use it epithelium side up, and we will try not to leave any areas uncovered, and this is to try to prevent new adhesions after the surgery. This is a reason actually why I don't like to use Procara for this kind of surgeries because it comes in a circular fashion and it will leave some areas uncovered. So we will cover the entire ocular surface, we will reflect the human amniotic membrane in the deep fornix. We can use some muscle hooks to do that. And we will cover the inner face of the lid. And so we are using it uh, as one entire sheet of membrane and we will create the adhesion with tissue adhesives. Then we will finish the surgery, placing an anchor in suture with a bolster. We will pass the sutures through the deep fornix, and um, this will be helpful um, keeping the, the fornix deep and firm after the surgery. Then we are going to fit a contact lens, and we are going to place a simplifier ring. This is uh, case number two, the, fi the firework trauma case immediately after the surgery. And we are back to case number one. This is the monocular patient. This is the pre-op picture. Here we can see the post-op day one, one month and two months. We can see uh, in the two month picture that we have removed the fornix suture we can see that the patient is still uh, using the simplefron ring and the eye is looking very quiet. This is the three years post-op. Um, we can see here that he has some fibrosis. I'm pulling from the lid down. He actually has a very deep fornix, but he has some fibrosis in the nasal area. And that's okay. That fibrosis has remained stable over there. And uh, I'm actually not planning to, on, to operate on that up to now, at least. This patient uh, is stable now. He uh, was totally blind before the surgery. And he recovered a 2050 uh, uncorrected visual acuity, so he's, which is really good for him. And he's back to his regular activities. This is case number two, the firework trauma case. And this is the case that didn't have a good outcome. I wanted to show this case because it is the perfect case for me to exemplify how important is the uh, anti-inflammatory therapy for this kind of surgeries. This patient was as severe as the other patient. They had the same management and uh, they had the same surgery, um, but this patient, his parents actually were very, very uncompliant with the treatment that we indicated and with the post-op follow-ups. This is the one day post-op, everything was looking good. This is the three weeks post-op and we can see that he still has some amniotic membrane in the eye, but the eye is looking very inflamed and this was because he was not using the medication. Then he didn't come back until the fourth month post-op. His simplefron and the eye was to inflame again. So as a conclusion, we can say that treating inflammation aggressively is an important factor in the prognosis of these cases. 
you have to be patient and wait enough time for the A to be quiet um, before going to do the before doing the surgery. Uh, a combination of medications might improve the outcome for this kind of surgeries, and the newer lab laboratory cellular expansion techniques might be the future for this kind of surgeries. Thank you very much. I don't know if there is any question or comment. Well, these are pretty um, scary looking cases, uh, Esteban. Um, uh, I, I did have a question, and one, the question has to do with, uh, you mentioned about conjunctival uh, transplants. Uh, the question has to do with conjunctiva versus um, um, Tenon's capsule. Um, and do you treat it in inflamed eyes uh, going in? Do you treat it any differently? Do you take out uh, much of the Tenon's capsule, which can sometimes be very thick, or do you leave it in place? Or what's your approach with the Tenon's membrane? So I, I, I actually try to remove the most amount of fibrosis we can. If I, if I see that the tenon's capsule is really thick and fibrotic, I, I try to remove it also. Yeah. And I, I, if, if they are inflamed, uh, as I said during the presentation, if uh, I try not to go to the surgery when the eye is looking uh, inflamed, uh, when I go to surgery for this kind of surgeries is when the eye is looking actually very quiet. And even for those cases that come to me that they have done some treatment in the past and the eye is not looking that uh, red and angry inflamed, uh, I just assume that they are inflamed because the eye is not healthy, even though the eye might be looking white. And I do the treatment for whole three months, and then I go ahead and do a surgery. And if I, if I actually find the tenons really thick, I, I will remove it. Okay, and so can you kind of explain a little bit more? You mentioned three months leading up to surgery, you treat it, and you mentioned the medications, but how frequently, how often do you see the patients? Uh, so can you tell me a bit more about what happens pre-op in terms of medications and how you administer them and how, you, how often you see the patient? Yeah. So these are patients that I actually see very often. Um, during the pre-op, uh, when I start the treatment, uh, I actually see them at the beginning once a week. If everything is going okay and the, the eye is getting better, I might see them maybe twice a month. Uh, so what I do is I start uh, with uh, cyclosporine twice a day. Uh, tacrolimus uh, ointment at night, and then I use doxycycline, 100 milligrams a day, and... Um, and sorry, I, what, what, what concentration of cyclosporin did you say? I use restasis, 0.05%, yeah. And then uh, tacrolimus is 0.03%. I, I actually... Uh, they make an ointment here at the hospital, so I use that ointment, um, and they use it at night. Uh, and they will continue with all of these medications after the surgery. They will continue the same. Uh, of course, after the surgery, I will use steroid. I will use Predforte uh, for the first few weeks until the eye is quiet, and then they are going to continue with uh, all, this all this treatment, the, the, the um, tacrolimus, the 5FU, the, the um, cyclosporine. And then after the surgery, I do, I, at first I observe the patient, uh, and if I see that the, the fornix is getting shorter, uh, I start doing in, uh, injections in the deep fornix with a combination of 5FU and tramcinolone which uh, I do uh, one injection every week for three weeks, then I take a break and see how this is working. And the, if the fornix starts getting shorter again, I do three more injections one, one week apart from each other. So 5-FU um, and, and uh, um, translonone, so how much do you put in? Yeah, I use 5 a few 5 milligrams in 0 0.5 millimeter, uh, milliliters, and then uh, tantinolone canalog, 40 milligrams in a milliliter. 
And so I combined both half a half in the same injection, and then I inject it in the deep furnace. I just maybe in three different sites. And at the beginning, I, I uh, began using only 5U, uh, and it worked good. But then I began uh, combining combining it with Tramsin alone, and it's, it, it is much better. You can actually see how the fornix gets deeper. Uh, it seems that the collagen gets with, uh, all the relaxation of the fibers, and the fornix gets deeper a few days after the injection. Uh, so I, and I do this for as long as it is necessary. Sorry, I cannot, I cannot hear oh, you. I'm sorry, I'm sorry about that. Uh, at what point do you think this is an appropriate case for uh, cornea and your segment person? Uh, I think um, Michelle's on here. Michelle Villavo is an oculoplastics person. And at what point do you think uh, we should be having our oculoplastics colleagues uh, um, uh, manage the case? I actually think uh, that it would, it would be a good idea for the severe cases to have uh, an oculoplastics involved because they might have some others, other ideas. Uh, the, the issue here in Argentina is that there are not many cornea specialists or oculoplastics that want to uh, get involved in these severe cases. Uh, but it would be good to have an input uh, for these severe cases. Michelle, any thoughts about that? Um, I'm not sure if you can. Yeah, sir. I'm new here. Yeah, I think that uh, it's a sort of a local circumstances situation. It just depends who's available, who's has experience, who's willing to help. Um, I seem to the ones the cases I seem to do, which certainly isn't a huge number. It seems to be either the acute, very severe traumas where I'm sort of doing it as part of my initial reconstruction, uh, dog bite, for example, or something like that, uh, or it's um, part of a, a, like a very late um, repair, like, you know, everything's quiet, the dust has settled, and someone's asking me to help out. And usually any of the ones in between, so ones that you guys are sort of actively following, trying to get quiet, and maybe doing some ther therapeutic, you know, early amniotic membrane just to try to quiet the surface, I'm often not really involved with those. Um, realistically, the the techniques um, for most of the, you know, especially inferior fornix reconstruction are fairly straightforward. I, I think that anyone who's done a few cases in either uh, subspecialty can, can handle them quite competently. I think uh, some of those cases um, that were shared today where you're, you're peeling symblepharon off the cornea, I think that's probably best uh, having certainly uh, someone with corneal expertise involved because uh, you never know what you're, you'll encounter, right? Who knows how thin the cornea is uh, in those areas and you might start leaking uh, at any point. Um, I, I, I actually don't feel too um, shy about using sutures if I, need, if I think I need it to get the amniotic membrane in place. I know there's a concern about uh, inducing inflammation, but realistically, I want that um, you know, graft to stay where I want it to stay. And if I think it takes a couple extra sutures to do that, I won't hesitate. I think the glue might, you know, cause a bit of potential inflammation anyway as it's dissolving. So I'm not really keen on putting a lot of glue. I'll certainly use glue sparingly if I think I can get it to where I need it. Um, but again, as anyone who uses glue knows, you can get the issues with it sticking to things and, you know, you try to release where, where you just placed it and then you displace your graft and you end up just sort of fighting yourself. So. I, um, you know, um, I'll certainly use sutures where I need them. Um, and then the other concern for us is that amniotic membrane isn't always the right choice if you need to actually give structure to the lid. So there's certainly other considerations where we'll use cheek mucosa or a hard palate or other, other tissues. Um, I would say in terms of, uh, you know, using conge as a graft, I generally am not, I uh, generally don't consider that too strongly just because I find that, uh, at least in the cases I'm involved with, you never get as much conge as you think you're going to get. If you're harvesting conge, you think, you, you know, you, you think you've got a piece that may be the size of a, a quarter or a nickel, and it ends up being a tiny little, you know, few millimeter patch, and it's just so hard to work with. So I generally don't, uh, don't go that route. Okay, thank you. Um, Esteban, how about your, what are your thoughts about um, 
in addition to the bolster sutures, uh, having a symblephron ring or a conformer type of apparatus to just further uh, distance the uh, palpebral conch from the bulbar conch. Do you ever use those? Um, I actually, I, I use um, symblephron rings uh, when I use, when I do the surgeries. Uh, the theory is actually very conflicting with this, with the use of these uh, conformers. Uh, we don't actually know if it helps, but I use it. It, it doesn't bother, that's for sure. So I try to use it for as long as the patient tolerates it. Uh, and it might, it might help. For sure, it will not help keeping the fornix deep. Uh, it might help giving it shape, but it will not have help uh, with the deepening of the fornix, that for sure. But yeah, I try to use it every, every, every time I do these surgeries. And any uh, preference as to which kind of fibrin glue? Because each fibrin glue has an, uh, a certain strength in terms of their um, use as a coagulative agent, you know, in, in, in other general anesthesia cases where you use it to control bleeding, and, and varying degrees of the adhesive property. Uh, so which uh, uh, fibrin glue do you like to use? I actually am using uh, TCL here uh, in Argentina. That's the one I have, and I have... I haven't had any problem at all. Uh, no inflammation or no, uh, the patients didn't lose the graft after the surgery, it created a really good adhesion. Uh, of course, I'm, I'm using a contact lens over it to keep it in place. Uh, but I, I, I just haven't had any, any problem with it. I, I don't have uh, experience with other uh, tissue adhesions for these big surgeries. Uh, but with this cell, I, I, it, it worked uh, well, actually. If anybody else has any other questions, uh, you can think of that. I have another question. Uh, I've heard some um, controversy whether having the amniotic membrane place epithelium up or down doesn't really matter. Um, what are your thoughts about that? I try to use it for this kind of surgery. I try to use it epithelium side up because for the theoret theoretical function of the amniotic membrane, uh, it's not a, a, an acute inflamed eye that I want the, the epithelium to look down to make use of the biological factors of the amniotic membrane. So I really want the, the basement membrane um, on all the structures from the amniotic membrane to fill the, the, the eye, but it's a theoretical function. I, I, don't, I didn't really find any paper that could uh, corroborate maybe this uh, uh, scientifically. Uh, all of the functions that we know from the human amniotic membrane are mainly theoretical because we know they have those biological factors and we know the structure it, ha it has. So that's a good point. Uh, Michelle just put out about the um, uh, kind of this book, No Epi on Ham. Uh, I guess I was more referring to the polarity of the tissue and which way to position it. Um, we have a question here. Any thoughts about using 5-FU injections before surgery to decrease in blepharon, especially if they are over the cornea? Um, so pre-op use of 5-FU injections. Uh, I actually didn't, uh, I didn't try it before the surgery. I don't think uh, uh, for these severe cases, they, they actually get referred uh, like this, like the picture you have seen right now. So they are like end stage uh, simplephron cases. I don't think there is a function for these cases. Maybe for acute cases where, or earlier cases where the simplephron is uh, in a lower degree, just starting to form, uh, there might be a role for the 5-FU injection just to stop the fornix to progress. Uh, but for these severe cases, I just uh, prefer to do the, all the treatment that I said. And all the drops, but uh, 
uh, I wouldn't try to inject in those uh, severe simplifying uh, uh, cases that I'm not seeing actually what's behind it. <laughs> And then you mentioned also about um, you know doing the work, but then considering uh, doing a stem cell transplant afterwards. Um, and so, do you like uh, using the SLET, where you take, say, if you have healthy tissue contralaterally, you take a maybe a clock hour or a bit more, and then you dice it up and spread it over uh, an eye that the involved eye that may have some uh, limbal stem cell compromise. Yeah, because uh, these cases, most of them are children. Uh, I just try to wait, not to rush into the uh, coronal stem cell transplantation. Uh, but when I do, I have done uh, uh, a few different slats, uh, a few different cases, and uh, they are working well, even though uh, I think there is a decrease in function for the, for the stem cells that we transplant. Maybe the pool is not big enough to keep the eye healthy or the cornea clean for many years. But uh, what I have seen is that during the first year, it works well. And after that, it, uh, it starts declining in, in function. Uh, but yeah, I have been doing SLED mainly. So I have to admit, I have not been as um, uh, aggressive on the anti-inflammation uh, aspect you've stressed so much. Uh, and maybe it's, I should be doing that more, or do you think more it's perhaps related to the pediatric uh, population you're dealing with, or would it be similar in adults? Or I would, Yeah, I would do the same for adults. Uh, I, I, I actually have done the same for adults here. I do exactly the same treatment, uh, and I think it works better. I actually believe that the main, these, these are difficult eyes, right? Um, but a big problem they have is that they are chronically inflamed and the eye is not healthy and we are not replacing all the structures and all the cells that should be there. And that's why maybe in the future, uh, these uh, uh, laboratory cellular expansion techniques, uh, the Comet, for example, or, or, or one of the other techniques might help to replace the, the the cells that were missing from the eye. But the inflammation actually, I think, is the main problem that creates the recurrences and the, aggress the, aggr the, aggr the, the aggression of the single effort. So, and one thing that I've always found interesting is the post op, actually, the, the very basic post op exam that you do. So, we've got a few techs who are on uh, the call here right now, we've got some residents. Um, any uh, thoughts on how to approach yeah, this, this patient post-op day one, post-op week one? You know, uh, usually the eyes are quite, you know, there's like amniotic membrane kind of the, reflected over the lids. There's these bolster sutures. So what's your, uh, how would you counsel or, or suggest that the techs work up patients or that the residents examine these patients very soon after uh, these fornix reconstruction uh, procedures? Yeah, for, for this, this case, it, it is a, bit, a little bit complicated, actually, because for these pediatric cases, um, we, uh, have, uh, we see them uh, under anesthesia, actually. Uh, we have a room to, for studies under anesthesia, and we, for the first uh, few weeks, uh, we uh, sleep them uh, once a week, uh, just to see that everything is looking uh, good. And then uh, maybe we have to see them in, uh, we, we just, uh, we, it's complicated. We will see that in, them in the slit lamp, but then they will not collaborate a lot. So if the amniotic membrane uh, is in the eye and the, and the, patient is not complaining a lot and they are using the medication, I think it is okay. But I really encourage everybody to sleep this patient in status under anesthesia at least once a week for the first few weeks because we can really pick up some things that like infections or some healing that we want to take care. 
off and we if we don't sleep these patients we will not see them okay uh, sama or michelle any um suggestions or thoughts about seeing these patients immediately post-op uh, i've had you know situations where uh, people have t yanked the entire amniotic membrane out just thought there was you know kind of something I c coming out of the eye um you know the discomfort of uh, uh um, some left front ring that may be too big for a particular eye. Um, any thoughts, Sama or Michelle, about managing these patients post op? In my experience uh, as a fellow here, I'm sure Dr. Belbo uh, will be able to comment on, on uh, more lengthy experience that he's had. But uh, I think the most essential thing that I've um, seen here is just ensuring that the AMT is thoroughly covering the ocular surface. Um, you want to ensure that it's in place if you place a symblephron ring, um, just ensuring that things are positioned well, that it's not riding up um, and irritating uh, the patient's cornea. Granted, there's a, a membrane of AMT beneath, but it can. I found that it can be quite painful uh, for patients. Um, we had a Stevens Johnson patient, for example, that just had Symblephron rings changed multiple times, uh, just a makeshift one made out of IV tubing because it was so uncomfortable uh, for her. But ensuring that you're giving an adequate size that helps um, keep that fornix, um, keep the AMT uh, spread out, keep the fornix as sort of st as stretched as possible while keeping the patient comfortable. Yeah, maybe, maybe maybe tell the the resident also not to try not to touch the amniotic membrane with a Q-tip or try to accommodate this. <laughs> yeah, I would say in general, with my uh, post-op routine is a, is a lot less intensive. But again, often the ones I'm seeing, um, if they're acute, they're generally trauma. If they're later on, they're generally quiet by the stage that I see them. So my approach is actually, I, do, I really don't want the patient touching the eye very much at all. So I will even do like, you know, twice a day ointment or, or three times a day ointment or, or and, and really not have them trying to pry the eye open to get drops in. But this is, you know, considering a, you know, an inferior fornix mucous membrane graft with, without, you know, you know yes, they may have had severe symblephron, but not in a, you know, complicated ongoing picture with active inflammation. So I try to get them to keep their hands off and the post-op approach is generally pretty hands-off as well. So yes, I, I will see them on a, on a regular basis to make sure things are still in place. But I, I unless I think, uh, you know, an intervention needs to be, unless there's a, an intervention that's going to change their course, I'm probably not going to, you know, really try to have a, a great look, like pull, pull, on the, pull on the lid and try to see the fornix with any depth. And the, and the same would apply with the children, where again, the circumstances obviously dictate the the uh, the post-op care um but if it's if it's someone who seems to be cruising along um i will you know certainly um avoid avoid general anesthesia and I, unless i think i will be doing something on, in that case as an intervention like if i if i if it's just to sort of check on things i probably won't put them to sleep but again it depends on the case and i think the cases that uh, esteban was talking about certainly that's a, a different um scenario but just to give to give a perspective on the spectrum there okay and sama what was that makeshift device with IV tubing i just wanted to say uh, it is not a general anesthesia that we do to see the patient it, it is just a sedation with gas okay So uh, with regards to the makeshift symblephron ring, um, for example, on the wards, um, if we don't have access to um, instruments once the ophthalmology ORs are closed here or the procedure rooms, uh, we, if we can't access an actual symblephron ring, it can be made just from cutting um, sort of a tubing from sort of a, a butterfly, basically, like a 23-gauge um, butterfly catheter or IV tubing um, that's uh, small enough to not be too uncomfortable. You cut both ends and just make a ring and make a slit on either end and put one end into the other. Uh, you have to be mindful of how bulky that um, area is where you've connected the two ends because that's usually the aspect that patients complain about the most. But 
I found that if that lies in the inferior fornix, they're generally okay as opposed to it being superiorly. But this is from the experience of using this um, at the bedside in a few patients that were in the ICU that uh, we weren't able to, um, to see in clinic. If I can ask another uh, question, um, just in terms of uh, Dr. Belvo had commented that he, uh, you tend to just uh, directly use oral mucosa as opposed to conjunctiva. Is there a specific um, cutoff, you would say, Esteban, in your practice over which, um, based on vertical shortening or width of a symblephron, that you would not even consider using conjunctiva from the fellow eye and would go directly to uh, oral mucosa? I actually, I maybe the oculoplastic will not be uh, will not like my answer, but <laughs> I actually try not to use oral mucosa um, for all, because of uh, all the complications that it might produce on the donor side, like bleedings, infections, analgesia, drooling, up, drooling after the surgery, and it might cause uh, hyperplasia uh, in the site of the in the recipient side. Uh, I just uh, try not to use it. I know it is widely used and it might be very good, uh, but I don't have much experience with that uh, because I always try not to use it, actually. <laughs> so I would, um, in terms of using conj on the, on the other side, it's, um, I would say so many of the, the patients, and not that it's a huge number, but just in terms of percentages, they tend to have bilateral disease. So there's not a, a, an abundance of um, extra conjunctiva lying around. So I'm, more commonly, I'm doing this, uh, you know, sequentially or, or simultaneously on both eyes. And so the other conj is often not a good donor site. In, in a case of trauma where it's purely one-sided uh, and they did happen to have a, a lax lid and a deep fornix, maybe you could get sufficient conj. I just haven't found that to be the typical case, and most patients who've had a traumatized eye may not be keen on having their healthy eye operated on, but again, it, it's just individual circumstances, and it's also how you frame it to the patient. And for me, like uh, harvesting cheek mucosa is certainly not uh, a big undertaking, and, and I, I guess like it's, uh, it's just all in terms of comfort and experience and what, what you're uh, happy doing. I would say I, um, it's surprisingly well tolerated. You, you would think it would be a, a source of pain, but I, I recently did it in a, I think it was an 11 year old, I did a, you know, a large um, cheek mucosal graft in an anophthalmic socket patient, prepared him heavily po uh, pre-op for all the, for the post-op discomfort that he was going to have, warned him that it would feel like he had a pizza burn in his mouth for about a week. And he was completely pain-free um, after the surgery and was just so happy about it. So as long as you set the right expectations, in this case, it worked out perfectly. Um, and then, uh, you know, there's certainly things to reduce uh, risk of infection. So you can do like a Paradex mouthwash um, afterwards um, for the first week or so, just like a, a swish and spit uh, mouthwash to keep things clean. Um, but again, er everyone who, everyone's practice has different preferences and tips and tricks we can use. And I certainly think, you know, whatever your option is, uh, I don't think there's any hard and fast rules um, to say one's better than the other. Awesome, any other questions? It's uh, good to see some familiar words and names. Um, so uh, I do have one question that's uh, very important, and uh, it's for both uh, Esteban and, and Javier. Uh, who, which country speaks better and the better uh, form of Spanish? <laughs> Is it Chile or Argentina? You know, Argentina. Constant, constant battle during that year. <laughs> you know, it is Argentina. <laughs> Okay, well, I think uh, we're getting close to the one hour mark. Um, thank you so much, uh, Esteban. That was really interesting. I learned a few things that may change the way I handle these cases. Uh, thanks for the input from everybody. Uh, next week, um, Reg, who is right now, uh, I think, in bed because it's super, uh, you know, he should be sleeping right now. Uh, Reg and Philip, he, he'll be uh, talking uh, with his team and uh, from um, Quezon City St. Luke's Medical Center uh, next week at 7 a.m. Uh, on Tuesday, Ottawa time. 
about um, the struggle against graft rejection. So I'm looking forward to that. And again, thank you, Esteban. Thank you for those who, atten who uh, attended. This session ha is being recorded. So once um, I figure out how to make it available, I'll make it available. And if no other questions, thanks again and have a great night. Thanks. Okay. Bye bye, Esteban. Thanks again. Eh? Thank you. Javier, I hope you're doing well. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Is this Marcela well. from uh, Chile? Yeah, she's there. Okay, awesome. So I was just telling Javier and Marcela that if you have an interesting uh, uh, you know, aspect of pediatric uh, cornea, that'd be great to share as well. Yeah, sure. Uh, I was talking with Marcella uh, a few hours ago and she was interested uh, in presenting about um, congenital cataract. But Marcella can, can, okay. can say. That, Are be you great. there yet? Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. I'm not sure if she's there, there, but that'd be great. And you're doing well, Javier, working hard the past 18 months getting at the transplant program going? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I, I had almost everything ready. Um, but the coronavirus arrived, <laughs> so oh, there's no harvesting <laughs> yeah. um, now. Uh, but uh, um, we are 11 ophthalmologists here. Um, I think 10 years ago, one of them uh, did two corneal transplants, PKPs, <laughs> okay. and that's all the experience here in oh. the north of Chile. Um, so they are compromised with the idea and the project. I have 70, uh, 69, 